Hi, I'm Mike Heislin, and I'm here for the Reloading po Podcast, one of the newest podcasts from the Firearms Radio Network. This is our pilot episode, and uh, today we're just going to kind of go over the basics of reloading and kind of cover, uh, you know, why you should get into it, um, kind of what the details are, and just a little basic on the on the uh, overview of reloading. We're not going to really get into serious in-depth just going to cover the basics on this one. Uh, we will get into more detail as we go along, and we'll have some live video of reloading and, and the different things like that. Going to cover uh, pistol, rifle, and shot shell uh, through this. Not necessarily all of that today, but uh, we're going to get through that uh, as we go, and we'll do different episodes of each. Uh, coming to you, I'm uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, first question, why should I reload? Well, uh, it's cost saving to a point. Um, what it is is cost savings is cost of per round. So say your uh, average, uh, you know, your average 9 millimeter round or your average 40 round or your average 45, you know, versus reloading uses, uh, depending on what you are reloading for, um, if you're just reloading lead bullets for practice, excuse me, if you're just reloading red bullets, lead bullets for practice, it's going to be quite a bit less expensive than if you're uh, shooting your, uh, like your hydroshocks or your, you know, your, your, uh, personal protection loads uh, that you're buying from the store where you're spending $25, $30 for just 20 of them. Obviously, using lead reloads is going to be a lot cheaper. Reloading rifle is definitely... You're, you're going to save a lot more when you're reloading rifle cartridges than pistol, usually. Uh, usually, the pistol you can buy in bulk for target practice, and it's not quite as much of a savings difference as it would be for a lot of your rifle calibers. Uh, another thing is reloading can be fun. You get a couple of, especially if you've got a couple of guys you shoot to get, or girls you shoot with on a regular basis, you can get together at somebody's house and everybody pitches in for like the cost of the press and then the cost of the dyes and then everybody brings their powder and their primers and their brass and their bullets and you have an afternoon or two reloading. You know, you spend a few hours doing it and time goes by and you're having a blast doing it. One of the biggest things a lot of people reload for is, and it's not quite as true as it used to be, but you get a little more control over the quality of your ammunition. Now, even your Winchester, your quote, Winchester white box is a really good round nowadays. Um, 15, 20 years ago, that wasn't necessarily the truth because a lot of that ammo wasn't necessarily... Um, loaded with the care and concern that uh, they use now. Wasn't really as consistent. You, The factory wasn't necessarily as concerned with the quality of the ammunition. They were just concerned about cranking it out. So you may have, you know, a case of, or, a, oh, excuse me. Uh, you might have a few rounds of that, uh, you know, your cheap basic ammo that, uh, is pretty close in powder and set up and everything, so maybe you get like a you know a pie plate group at uh, 25 yards out of your handgun. Where nowadays, you know, that's a lot better, and you know, four inch group. Well, with reloading, if you're reloading for accuracy, you could literally have you know one hole. Uh, not so much in the pistols necessarily, but definitely in your rifles, especially your bench rushed shooting. And uh, when we get to that point of the uh, reloading, we'll actually have a couple of experts, well, uh, experienced people, not necessarily experts, uh, or to say, uh, experienced people who are doing that bench rest reloading. And, and that's what they, so they're going to come and they're going to cover exactly all the stuff that they would do for that. Overall, reloading, if you're going to get basically... A, if you're going to get into the basic level of it, you can do it for pretty reasonable. 
if you go with just your basic, your basic, basic, which would be from Lee, it's a little hand-operated uh, reloading press that's $20, $25. And then it's just a cost of your primer and your press and everything else. You can also spend a lot of money. Uh, there's, you know, some commercial style presses out there that are, you know, a few thousand dollars. But those are more for, like, competition shooters that are going to be cranking out, you know, that, that shoot a thousand, five thousand rounds a week. You know, not your average person that goes to the range and shoots, you know, a couple hundred rounds. Maybe a month. Or maybe not even that much. You know, maybe it's a, just a deer hunter that wants... Uh, some a uh, little more accurate, you know. There's uh, looking for that that really tight group that you know, half an inch center to center, or you know, where all five rounds are touching, versus that factory load that they, you know, inch inch and a half at 100 yards, and you know, that type of thing where they're looking for a little tighter group for a better accuracy, because maybe they're taking a little longer shot, or like. The, they're uh, planning on doing some longer range shooting, so they need a little more consistent or maybe a little, uh, quote, hotter round. What hotter means is it's it's loaded with a, a little more powder than, say, a factory load. Um, still within your pressure specs, but it's uh, going to move a little faster. So therefore, as it gets out further, it's not dropping as quickly. It has a little more power behind it. Um, one of the big questions about reloading, is it legal? It's legal in all 50 states. Uh, the only thing I could find anywhere is uh, there's some internet companies that won't ship anything to Massachusetts because of some legal issues, but there's plenty of local suppliers in Massachusetts that you can still get all your components and be able to reload with. Um, it's uh, not anything that they've really started to go after yet. Um, as far as any of the, quote, gun control laws that they're trying to do, you know, your assault rifle bans and stuff like that, reloading is an area they haven't touched. So it's, uh, I don't know if it just flies under the radar or they don't realize or it's just one of those things that they've decided that isn't worth trying to and I'm very grateful that, for that. And there's a lot of us in this community that are very grateful. Uh, the f reloading community is a lot like the regular firearms community. Everybody's out trying to help each other. A lot of forums and a lot of information out there that you can find. Uh, a lot of people willing to help teach, which is an important thing. And speaking of teaching, how do you get started in this? Well, the first thing you got to kind of do is you have to set up a dedicated area. Now, if you just, like myself, um, I have my workbench uh, out in my garage. So I've got it set up so my bench is mount my uh, press is mounted on there, and even if I'm not reloading and I'm using it for other things, the press is still on there, and then when I get ready to reload, I clear everything else off the bench and uh, set it up so I can just do all my reloading on there, and nothing else goes in that area when I'm reloading or getting ready to reload. I don't have the space because of the place I live to have a dedicated reloading bench. Uh, if you can, if you have the space, that is the best way to do it. There's plenty of plans out on the internet. There's actually a lot of different things you can... A lot of companies that sell complete benches. I know a couple of people that have gone to, like, say, Home Depot or... Uh, Harbor Freight or Northern Tool, and you get one of their basic workbenches, the wood ones, and they do well. Uh, there's a lot of plans you can build, or you can just kind of, you know, craft your own. If you're handy with wood, you know how to build a sturdy, sturdy solid bench. It's going to have to be something that's uh, not going to shift or shake, though, because with the reloading, when you start using the presses, you do apply a lot of pressure. So you can't have something that's weak uh, or that has any give to it. It's got to be solid and not moving. Once you've got the bench area set up and your organizational area, then, um, and, and part of this, part of that is in the bench area is 
what are you going to reload? Are you going to do shot shells? Are you going to do pistol? Are you going to do rifle? Are you planning on doing them all? Uh, are you reloading for quantity or quality? Typically, even your best multi-stage presses aren't going to give you that consistent um, round quality that you're looking for if you're going to be doing bent shooting or you're looking for that sub-MOA. Um, MOA stands for minute of angle, and that's one inch at 100 yards, and then it changes from that. Going out, it doesn't necessarily, it's not like, it doesn't necessarily follow inches. It's an actual separate measurement system, and there's plenty of places on the web that explain that, so it's not a big deal to us here at the current moment. Now, if you're just looking to do single cartridge, there's a lot of simple presses out there. Um, there's a few different companies. There's RCBS, uh, Redding, Hornaday, Lee, Dillon, I think are, you know, I think for the most part are the big players. I have, uh, I personally at the current moment have Lee. I have a uh, anniversary kit single stage press and then I have a uh, Loadmaster multi-stage. So uh, I use the single stage for my 308 for my rifle for hunting because I want more accuracy out of that and that and that's actually how I got started was single stage. You can jump up to a multi-stage right away. Uh, it's not necessarily recommended by a lot of people, including myself, because um, by going the single stage, you kind of really learn the steps you need to pay attention to. Reloading is a fun hobby, but it's also a dangerous one. If you don't do your steps right, you can easily overload the shell or screw up and not put a primer in, and then you've got powder leaking all over the place, and powder is very flammable. It's uh, something that definitely you need to take the time and effort to make sure you're paying attention to while you're doing it. Uh, once you get your press decided on and you find your press, you get your press, you get your press bolted down. Now we're getting serious about reloading. So what we're going to be doing um, is case prep. And this is what a case looks like. This is uh, one of my 308 cases. Oops. Sorry. Uh, I've got my second camera here, and it's trying to... I'm realizing everything's backwards, so as I move it, it goes the opposite direction. So bear with me. But this is your case. Uh, this is a uh, non-rimmed case. And what that means is up at the top here, See how it doesn't stick out, but it's even the same size all the way down. So uh, this is a spent case with the dirty with the primer still in it. I haven't uh, deprimed this yet or anything like that. I just grabbed this one uh, out of my brass bin so that way I'd have one to show. Now. Um, what we're going to do is, with this particular brass, what you do is you'd clean it. Um, first step of that, in my way I do it, is I deprime all my brass first. Um, you have to clean out the primer pocket no matter what. It's a little easier with depending on what media you're using to clean it. Um, any at any rate. No matter what way you're cleaning it, it's a lot easier if you just take the, the primer out first. And what you need for that is in your press, when you buy your dies, there is a depriming. Uh, I've got a set of dies over here. I'll grab those quick. I can show that to you. Okay. All right, so this here is a, this is how Lee sends out their dies, um, some of them anyway. Basically what this comes with is it comes with your three different dies and your powder 
dipper. Uh, what the powder dipper is, is it's a thing from Lee that they've come for measuring out the powder to try and make it a little easier. These kind of just uh, sit in here. They, they do thread in a little bit, so you can unthread them and pull them out. And uh, this one here, I'll set upside down. As you can see, as soon as it stops moving, it's got this little pin sticking up here. And what the pin does is you take your brass and it slides on like that. And then what it does is it pushes that primer out. Um, obviously, it won't do it now because I've got, it's not in the press, so I don't have enough. It does take quite a bit of force to press that out. It's not something you can just push down with your hand. Um, but what that does is that little, they call it a decapping or depriming pin. And what that does is it just goes through the hole where the primer shoots the um, burning, pow uh, burning primer through into the powder, and it just pushes that primer back out. Okay. So we take our primer, we take that out, and then we throw this in our media. Well, what you're looking for with your media, for the longest time they've been using corn cob with a vibrating, um, sorry, a vibrating uh, cleaner, I guess. Uh, basically what it is is it a uh, large bowl that sits on a vibrating motor. You put your media in there, usually corn cob or walnut, and then you put your brass in there and it vibrates around. And essentially it's kind of like bouncing around in there and it just, as it rubs by, it rubs the dirt off both on the inside and the outside. The newest way is with stainless steel media and that's in a wet solution. You can actually buy the stainless steel media uh, tumblers or what a lot of people I know are doing is actually getting rock tumblers. Uh, go to your local rock shop or you can find them online, or um, I saw a couple weeks ago Harbor Freight had one for like $60. And then you just buy your stainless steel media, which is different types of uh, shapes of stainless steel. I think that's all rods, but I'm not sure. I personally haven't seen a setup on that. I've just heard some people talking about it. It is supposed to be the cat's meow. Uh, it takes brass and actually usually makes it a little cleaner uh, than the way it comes out factory. Now the other thing you can do is you can use your corn cob media or your walnut media like I do. Uh, I use corn cob and then uh, they have a chemical solution that you can make up using Dawn dish soap and lemon something or other. Oh, I can't remember off the top of my head, sorry. Um, bear with me a second. No, find out here because I don't remember off the top of my head. It's just a brain fart thing. But basically what it is, is you, uh, and if you search through, there's a lot of different uh, things on there. So, and that's not what I want. All right. Uh, you can use just Dawn dish soap. There actually is. Uh, there's a lot of different things in there. Um, it's lemon something or other, and I can't remember what it was. Um, bear with me here. It's I'm 
Some people say you can use simple green. Vinegar and water um, you can use to clean them. There's a couple of other. Yeah. Uh, the tumbler is the easiest way to do it. Uh, tumblers have gotten a little more expensive over the years, but, uh, you know, you can still do it reasonably. Uh, by far and away, the tumbler is the best. Uh, the dish soap method where it's okay, but it doesn't really get it shiny. Um, the tumbler is by far and away the easiest because it's a set it and forget it. You can just throw the tumbler, the, the brass into the tumbler with the media, turn it on and walk away and do stuff. You know, that's a great thing. And it'll clean out your inside and your outside without having to do any scrubbing. That's kind of the really nice thing about that. Okay, so we take our case, we pop the primer out, throw it in our tumbler, and walk away. Say we go mow the lawn or whatever, you know, you're going to do. Come back, you uh, use the sifter to sift the brass out of the media, separate it out, make sure you get all the stuff out. Uh, usually what I'll do is I'll actually, uh, you know, you can grab like a can of compressed air or if you got an air compressor in the garage or whatever, you can use that or you can just take and blow through the primer pocket to make sure you blow all that media out and kind of visually inspect. So then what you got to do is uh, reloading is a process that needs organization from start to finish. You need to make sure you stay organized so you can really keep an eye on everything and make sure you're not overdoing steps or underdoing steps. And what I like to use for that is this little thing right here. So what this is, is this is, uh, this one's from Cabela's, as you can see the logo on the side. But what it is, it's just a simple block, and you can make these yourself with a drill press or a wooden router or whatever, or just a simple hand drill and auger bit. But it just uh, is a place to set the brass. So you take your brass, you set it in like that, and then you've got a whole collection of brass on here, and you can go through... Um, put it in there. And then what you're going to do is you need to actually prime the brass. So you need to put primers in, and I don't know if I've got any primers set out here or not. Sorry. Uh, I did. I, re I originally recorded this episode a couple weeks ago, but uh, had some audio difficulties, and it really sounds horrible. If you want to laugh, it's on the YouTube channel, so you can watch it. It's kind of really some bad audio. I used a sub-quality uh, headset that I thought was okay and it wasn't and it picked up all my breath and so every couple seconds it sounds like a bad uh, you know bad horror movie almost. Uh, what you're gonna do is you're going to prime your brass. So most people know from looking in the middle of the brass you can see the primer and We'll get the focus. So you can see the primer. That's the piece that's got the little divot in it. Um, in the middle there, you're going to prime that with a new one. So you're going to have a hole there. And there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, most of your presses have a way to do it on there using what they call a shell holder. And these are shell holders. So I can get this thing open without throwing them all over the place. This is from Lee. And uh, what these are is they're little spots that little metal things that you just uh, are designed to hold the shell in place. I... And all the holes are different sizes. So as you can see when it focuses in. They're all different sizes, and there is a one end that's open right here on the top end here on this one. So you can actually slide the brass in. Uh, that's not the right one, I don't think, so it's not going to slide in. There we go. 
And so you can just slide it in like so, and then it holds the brass. So, and then on the bottom part, there's actually a hole. So if you look, you can see in the middle of the hole, you can see the little dimple from that primer. So you're going to use that to hold it in place, and then you can go ahead and push a primer in. Now there is another way, there is other ways to do the primers because there is hand primers, which I have one from Lee. It's called the Lee Auto Prime. Uh, mine's the Auto Prime 2. The current one is the Auto Prime XR, XL. Uh, there's links for some of these in the, in the show notes. But uh, what it allows you to do is it allows you to slide each brass in and then squeeze the primer in by hand so you can get a more consistent primer seat. Primer seating is very important to your overall. If you don't get that seated right, either your firing pin can strike it when the bolt comes forward, or setting it off prematurely, or the bolt won't close because it hits the primer, or the other problem is light primer strikes because the primer is too deep in and the firing pin comes out and won't fully strike the round. You want to make sure that you get the primer flush with the edge of the brass. I don't know if this will show up or not, but yeah, kind of. Um, you can see that looking across, move it over so you can get the, you can see moving a, it's flat across there. And if you have a bad primer seat, you'll have a bulge there and then you're going to have all sorts of issues. Next up, once you've got your primer seated, is powder. Lots of different options for powder. And what you're going to want to determine what you're going to do for powder and what you're going to do for bullet is you need what is called a recipe. Um, primers, there isn't really any option for this specific cartridge. You use this specific primer. It's not really any special options where you can choose a different primer. Some people, you know, there is an option on some of your cartridges where you can use a Magnum primer versus a standard primer. And then there's some cartridges where you have to use a Magnum. Um, the only thing the Magnum does, it gets a little hotter charge. Um, the drawback to it is it does increase the pressure in the cartridge. Because it does burn hotter, therefore burns more powder immediately and raises the pressure. Your powder has a specific burn rate and all of your recipes are based off of that burn rate to keep you from generating too much pressure. If you get too much pressure, you can blow stuff apart, you can shoot the bolt back, you can blow the chamber apart, you can, you know, if you don't have enough pressure, you, you get what's called a squib, squib load where you get a bullet stuck in the barrel um, other issues like that. And what you're going to do to get your recipe is you can use a manual, which I have one here. Uh, this is just the first one that I got because uh, it came with my Lee Anniversary Kit, Modern Reloading 2nd Edition. Uh, you can also go to different websites. Uh, different bullet manufacturers will have uh, different recipes on their websites and uh, you've got different uh, options out there. There is uh, quite a few different reloading options for recipe location. I did put uh, a few in the show notes. So once you get your powder, there's three different t styles. There's extruded, there's flake, and then there's ball. Um, ball kind of self-explanatory, it's round balls that uh, and all three of these fill the case differently, so therefore the recipes are different. You're not going to use necessarily the same weight. And what the recipe is, is how many grains of powder you're going to use. And one of the ways you can determine that is with a powder scale. Uh, this is a manual scale from Lee. It comes as part of their anniversary kit. The manual scales are usually pretty accurate. Uh, within the last 15 years, digital has really come along. Uh, this is the kit. Uh, 
This is the scale that I got because it's the one that came with the kit. But I am going to be getting a uh, bleh, sorry. I'm going to be getting a uh, digital scale just because uh, it makes it a lot easier for uh, quick measuring, shall we say. So now comes the fun part. Let's see if I can get this to show up. Most of the rest of the stuff I can either adjust the height on or is tall enough. Aha. So, okay, this is a powder scale from Lee. Um, very good quality, very accurate. The only drawback is it is kind of temperamental and it is kind of a pain to use. Uh, it's not going to come in real clearly, but what you can see is this is a pendulum style. You can see the numbers across the whoops. You can see the numbers across the top here. Unfortunately, like I said, I'm working on getting a better camera, so this is kind of just what I did for now. And you can what you do is you put your powder in here and then it pulls it down or up. Most people have used a balance scale in chemistry or something like that. This this ball here moves along and moves out to set your uh, whole numbers and then you also have part numbers, partial numbers, um, tenths shall we say, tenths of a, of a whole number that you use for green measurements. Now you can see that better. So what you can see here is they have uh, two different options or two different extra measurements here where you're going to set your tenths and hundredths of a grain uh, using this. And then here is your actual whole numbers and you can see the ball here. So that's going to be kind of the basic scale. Uh, like I said, digital scales and, and there is a lot better manual scales out there too. This is just the one that came with the kit that I got, so this is the one that I started out using. I at some point in, at some point in time you just kind of you start out where you start out and then you slowly as you get into it more you work on upgrading and uh, some people upgrade as soon as possible. Some people get used to using it the way they do it and they don't ever change. Uh, I do know quite a few people that are still using their original powder scales. And there are some people that you know try using those powder scales they just don't have any luck doing it and they either stick with the powder dippers which actually aren't bad. Aren't bad. Um, I've used them and I use them with reasonable accuracy. It's not quite as consistent as measuring, but it gets you close. And how the powder dippers work is it comes with a big selection here. And they're all different sizes. As you can see, there's a couple in there that are a little darker because they've seen powder. And they're all in cubic centimeters. <coughs> now what Lee does is they have a chart It slides back and forth with your different powders. And it gives you your powder numbers or your powder names. And then it tells you the conversion from how many grains to which size powder measure to use. So that's kind of uh, overall use on that. Next up, well, how are you going to get the powder in the brass? Here is our block again. Our friendly little block. And what you're going to use is a powder funnel. Here is a powder funnel. Just goes on like that. Pour your powder in like this. Now the other option, and Lee has one, quite a few different people have them. But what it is, is it's a actual powder dispenser. And this is it right here. This is the one 
the basic style of this here is what they also use in their multi-stage presses. It's got a little gradient uh, adjuster here. Your powder goes in here, and then it's just a lever. As you can see here, there's a lever on the side, and you just slide it down, open it up, power, powder comes out of here, usually into your funnel or straight into the brass, depending on the size. More than likely, you're probably going to wind up using a funnel. Some people actually dispense this into one, into one thing and then actually uh, put it into the brass from there. And then you just flip it back off, shuts the floor back off, and opens this up again so you can get another charge into here of the exact amount, and then you just pull the lever down. It's uh, Once you get it set and learn how to use it, it's very repeatable. It may not necessarily be quite as accurate as... Uh, Sorry, it might not necessarily be quite as accurate as a digital scale, especially some of the higher end ones where it actually dispenses the powder for you. But I digress, because we missed a step. Rather, I missed a step. Before you, after you get the primer set, uh, or bef when you're, sorry, not even primer set, but when you're decapping or depriming your brass, one of the things that that die does is it also sizes it. Um, and there's actually two ways you can go for sizing. You can either use the primer one. The primer one is the better one if for what we call once fired brass, where you've actually shot that firearm before with that brass in it. Frankly, it's the most fun way to get brass. Because, oh darn, you have to go to the range. So, you, that's my favorite way to get brass. However, um, some people don't have that luxury, and so what they have to do is they actually have to go buy uh, what they call cleaned and deprimed brass. Now, that may be brass that either never was loaded in the first place, or was loaded and shot and picked up at a range and somebody's selling. I prefer to shoot my brass because then it's sized and it makes life a little easier as opposed to uh, having to size it twice. Um, as you can see there's two different in this kit and in most of them there's actually two different dies. So one of them is the uh, I can't remember. It's been a while since I've reloaded 308, so bear with me a second. Um, <laughs> okay. So the short one is what they call the full-length sizer. That's for your never-fired brass or your brass that's never been fired in your particular firearm. That's this one right here. What this is going to do is it's actually going to size that whole case, and the thing you're going to, you're if you're shooting for accuracy, you're not going to get that accuracy until you've fired that brass in your firearm once. So your that brass expands out and fills your chamber. This is the one for once fired brass. It uh, different little different sizing. Uh, that's the one I prefer to use because, like I said, I've already shot that brass once in my firearm, so it's actually sized to my chamber. Not all chambers are cut the same. Uh, you'll learn that as you go through with firearms. You can have actually, uh, and actually you can have, say, you buy two Glock 19s, and you've got them both sitting side by side. Those chambers are not exact. They may have come off the assembly line. Say they're consecutive serial numbers. The chamber is still not going to necessarily be completely exact just because you have different conditions. Metal is a, a substance that doesn't necessarily always keep the same exact setup that it should as far as size. Now, I'm not talking noticeable size, but what I am talking is when that brass expands upon firing, if it's not pre, if the outside of that brass isn't pre-sized to your exact chamber, it uses some of that pressure to push the brass out instead of pushing the bullet down the barrel. So that can affect accuracy. 
there's lots of little different things that can affect accuracy. Once you've uh, sized that case, a lot of the times you're going to wind up using, when you go to size these cases, um, after you've, and usually what I'll do is I'll deprime them and then I, after they're cleaned I'll go through and actually resize them uh, just to make sure. Because you can, you want to be, you want to be sure and make sure that it's set up for the bullet and everything. Uh, a couple of different things you can use uh, for case lube is there's the cream resizing lubricant and then my favorite actually this came with my kit so that's why I have it but my favorite actually is this beautiful stuff from Hornaday it's called one shot and what it is is it's an aerosol case lube it, the propellant evaporates and just leaves the lube behind and all you gotta do is just put all your brass in that lovely little wooden block and then just come along and spray it and let it dry for a couple minutes and then away you go it's a beautiful thing saves you a lot of time uh, with the cream, you got to sit there and you got to rub it around the outside of the case and take your sweet time and try and get some on the inside of the neck. Or you have to get a brush and put a big goo on there and then br run the brush in through the inside of the neck. A lot of time consuming and a lot of waste because just like, you know, when you put ketchup on your plate, unless you really spend some time and effort, you're still not going to get all the ketchup up. So it's even worse with this because you're not going to you know, take your finger and try and get it necessarily always, and you're not going to be able to always use all of that uh, case size in the lube. So that's kind of why I really like that one shot. That's really nice. Next up is, okay, so we've gone through, we've sized our case, then we went through and we put the powder in it. Uh, or sorry, we've sized our case, we've primed it, and now we're ready for the powder, so we use our powder measure, put the powder in through the funnel, and move the funnel to the next case. Well, we're all done. So now what we got to do is put your bullet in. And there is your bullet die. Oops. Stand up. Put your bullet die your bullet seating die is, <coughs> excuse me, what your bullet seating die is, is going to be your device that actually pushes the bullet into the case and then actually crimps the edge of the case. to put the bullet in and hold it. Now, if you're just reloading for shooting at the range and you don't really care, at that point in your time, you're done. You pull your uh, different bullets and you pull your bullets up or you put your bullet in, set your press down, crimp it, you're good to go. Now, if you are reloading for hunting, or for a little more serious, then what you want to do is what they call a if I can get the thing open factory crimp die. And what the factory crimp die does is uh, See how it's got the little collet in there, the little uh, four cross? What that does is that actually puts a regular crimp into it. And you don't need a bullet with a cantalure. Um, what a cantalure is, where'd they go? I don't know if these are the ones with the cantalure or not. What a cantalure is, is a line in a bullet. Nope. And what it does is it allows you to, as you can see, I've got quite a few different bullet cases around here. Here we go. Okay, so this is a bullet with a cantaloupe. And what that does is it gives you a, see how it's got the line in there? Move it closer so you can kind of see a little better, I think. 
Yeah, um, it's got the line in the bullet. What that is is that's going to be a spot where you can actually, oops, sorry, uh, where you can actually crimp that rifle case into the bullet without squishing the bullet and changing the ballistics of the bullet. The reason for doing the more serious crimp is the bullet starts to move when the pressure generates enough to release it from the case. Uh, if you don't crimp crimp, if you just do the the, f the regular uh, crimp that does with every basic die, then what happens is that is not necessarily a set pressure level on when that bullet starts to move. Versus with the factory rifle crimp, it requires to have a certain pressure before that bullet starts to move. And what that means is... Sorry, let me switch cameras here. What that means is the bullet has to have a certain pressure before it actually starts to move from that case hitting the landing grooves and going on its merry way down to whatever you're planning on destroying with that bullet. With the factory rifle crimp, you have to have that same pressure every single time generated to move that bullet. So you're just removing another variable on your inconsistencies. You're making sure that that bullet is moving the same every single time when you pull that trigger versus a regular crimp where it may not. It may be up to 5,000 or 10,000 um, units of pressure difference. It's CUP is the pressure rating for reloading and I don't remember what CUP stands for off the top of my head at the current moment. That's kind of one of those things as we go through and I actually do some reloading. We'll kind of go over. This is just kind of overviews. Um, now, so where can you get the equipment? There's a lot of different places. I included some in the note, in the show notes and kind of in some of the different intro, the actual, um, sorry, uh, some of the different uh, presses that are available are also in there. One of the things you're looking at is what do you do once you're done with your completed cartridge? And it's a cartridge. It's not a bullet. The bullet is just somebody says bullet, it's just this. That is just your bullet. This is a cartridge, or some people call it a round. Um, but this is a completed, fully loaded, ready to go, put in your gun, put your booger hook on the bang switch, and send it flying down the range. And it's probably one of the most common misnamed is when people call it a bullet, call this whole entire cartridge a bullet, which... It goes back to black powder, essentially. Is That's where that kind of started, and it just never changed when they went to a completely self-contained cartridge. So once you get done, then it's time to go play at the range and see how well or how poorly you've done on your reloading. The more you do it, the better you get. Your first couple loads... Uh, my first couple, when I was trying to reload my 308 for accuracy, were horrible, honestly. I uh, I think the first recipe I came up with, uh, recipe would be the full bullet powder combination. The first recipe I came up with, I think, was 9 inches across and this is shooting from a bench on a rest so you take out your variables you know I, I'm still pulling the trigger myself so that's still a variable but the, the recipe was just that different plus I didn't have the factory rifle crimp die at that time I was just using the regular uh, the regular crimp that comes with the bullet seating die so you've got that inconsistency and you get a couple other inconsistencies and 
over time of practice, I learned how to be more consistent and more consistent and more consistent. Uh, just doing different things. Uh, next episode, I'm actually going to go through and show you what I do. We're going to go out to my reloading bench, and I'm going to hand load 308s. So you can see all the steps and actually see how it goes as it goes and get an idea of what that's all entailing. So join me next week. Uh, if you want to join this live, you, we're going to be recording on Sundays. Um, once you uh, follow the Reloading Podcast on YouTube and on uh, Google+, Plus, if you send it on, follow on Google+, Plus, uh, you'll notice, you'll get a notification of when the next Hangout's going to be. It's going to be on Sundays. I, looking at setting it up for 6 o'clock p.m. Central. That's my shooting goal, uh, my my time to goal to shoot for is to actually do the Hangout at 6 p.m. Central. And one of the nice things about the Hangouts is you can actually ask questions as we go. Uh, it's not just going to be me this whole time on this. I'm going to have some of my friends. I've got a couple of friends that are looking to get into reloading that we're going to be doing some time with. And we're going to go on location and help them set up their reloading rooms. Uh, I've got a few other people throughout the Firearms Radio Network that reload and outside the Firearms Radio Network that reload that we're going to have on and do panel discussions and and uh, kind of, you know, go through and cover all the different things of reloading. Anybody who's been doing reloading for a while knows that there is a plethora of tactics that you can cover, um, arguments on what powder, what style of powder, what bullet, what manufacturer, and, and all the different things. Uh, I, like I said, I just covered kind of the basics, gave you an overview, and I just ask you to bear with me. This is my first video podcast. Uh, I've done some audio podcasting in the past, but video is a whole different setup. Uh, this one wasn't maybe necessarily the best, but as we go, it'll get better. And plus, once we get on, you know, when we're doing stuff out in the bench or we're doing stuff other people, it's going to be a whole different experience because you're going to actually get to see everything going on as it goes on as opposed to now, which is just me sitting here talking to you and showing you a couple of different things. So I ask you to just keep coming back, and if you have any suggestions for improvements or comments or questions, um, you can uh, post them in the comment section underneath the video. Uh, I haven't uh, Jake at the fire Jake Challenge is the president of the Firearms Radio Network, who has set up this show, and we have not gotten a show email address set up yet. Uh, just the pilot, so we're just getting the first episode out there and going from there. So any suggestions or anything, just put them in the comments, or you can put them on the uh, Google Plus Reloading Podcast page. Just search for Reloading Podcast. That's what it's called. Just uh, thank you for hanging in here and joining me on this lovely adventure. And uh, as you just keep coming back every week, and we can all learn together. Because one of the things about reloading, you're never going to know everything. It's it, it's There's different things that change, and you can always learn more. You can learn different techniques for doing things, different uh, recipe combinations for trying for different uh, bullet weights, and different things like that. So uh, thank you very much, and have a good night.